Victoria Phillips and Susie Jones are friends. They're 10 years old, very smart, highly precocious, and just catching on to how the world really works. They are not to be underestimated. It's a beautiful spring day in Milltown, and the girls decide they need some money. Vicky's dad, Jordan Phillips, <clears throat> has been schooling his daughter at home each evening to offset her experience at the local middle school, where teachers, mostly nice ladies with clipboards, dole out facts each school day as an alternative to an actual education. The girls get the idea to set up a table in front of the house where there's a well-traveled sidewalk and to sell homemade lemonade to passers-by for a dollar a glass. Vicky has learned from her dad that a dollar is actually an intrinsically worthless Federal Reserve note, but she makes it a point to keep this information to herself lest she appear weird to her friend Susie, and appearing weird is the very last thing a 10-year-old wants to do. The girls make up a batch of organic lemonade, lightly sweetened with a touch of organic stevia. They make a sign, gather some disposable paper cups, and set up shop in front of the Phillips family residence on a pleasant Saturday morning. And before the first customer can arrive, along comes a spider. It's Bryce, one of Milltown's finest young boys in blue. The crime rate in Milltown is approximately 0.0000001%, this being a small New Hampshire town where the right to carry concealed firearms means that every other Milltownian could have a loaded Glock 9mm semi-auto strapped to their ankle, concealed in a fanny pack, tucked into their pants, or even down their brassiere. Heck, a large enough bosom could easily conceal a loaded 45. Now the bad guys know this, so they give Milltown a wide berth since no bad guy wants to get blown away by grandma. It's just too embarrassing. The near-zero crime rate notwithstanding, young officer Bryce is decked out like Robocop, complete with truncheon, sidearm, walkie-talkie, flashlight, handcuffs, shiny black shoes, and, of course, the de rigueur Kojak-style bald hairdo. Well, that is if one can call the total absence of hair on a 25-year-old a hairdo. Officer Bryce approaches the lemonade stand. He says hello. Susie looks up and freezes, such as her terror of police officers impersonating Robocop. Vicky looks up, smiles brightly, and says hello to Officer Bryce, who has no idea what quicksand he has just stepped into. The conversation will now continue. Robocop. You cannot sell lemonade without a license. Vicky. I'm sorry, officer, we can't. Why not? because there's a law against selling lemonade without a license. Really? I've read the New Hampshire State Constitution, officer, and I don't remember seeing anything in there that says y you can't sell anything you like to someone else as long as they want it and they pay you for it. Now, Vicki didn't quite have this right, but she was certainly well ahead of 98.6% of the adult residents of Milltown already. The conversation continues, and with a warning to the sensitive reader, because things are going to go sideways from here. Officer Bryce is taken aback by any mention of a constitution, especially from a 10-year-old girl, and he struggles internally to refocus his manly authority. You'll have to take your lemonade stand down right now, young lady, unless you can show me a license. So how do we get a license, officer? You go down to the town hall and pay the town clerk. But isn't that for grown-ups? I'm just a minor. His exasperation growing, Officer Bryce now makes a big display of hiking up his tool-laden crime enforcement belt and continues. Then your parents will have to go get a license. But my parents aren't selling the lemonade, officer. I am. <laughs> Vicky has learned this principle of triangulation and deploys it here deftly, causing Officer Bryce to sense his authority dangerously draining. He ups the ante, bends closer, and declares with as much crime control emphasis as he can muster. If you girls don't stop selling lemonade to the public right now, I'm going to have to write you a ticket and your parents will pay the fine. At this moment, our hero Jordan, who has been monitoring the crime scene from the garage, steps up to provide some citizen intervention. Officer, the girls will be pleased to take down their lemonade stand and I'll be sure to explain to them your position on the matter. I note that the sign painted on your cruiser says to protect and serve, which of course refers to the public, and I thank you for your dedicated monitoring of suspicious neighborhood activities. You have a good day. 
Officer Bryce can't tell whether he's just been complimented or insulted, but he nods and returns to the crime control vehicle. The girls pack up their lemonade, cups and sign, and they head indoors. Suspiciously, however, the table is left behind. Its work is not yet done. Jordan sits the girls down in the living room and explains their new business model. Ladies, you need to understand that the nice people who sit on the town council and make up the rules that we Miltonians are expected to obey have probably never read the federal constitution or the constitution of the state of New Hampshire. They don't understand that each citizen enjoys the inalienable constitutionally protected right to conduct business with any other citizen in any manner in which they both agree, so long as no fraud is committed, in which case the aggrieved party can take the matter to court for adjudication. Jordan waits patiently while Vicky asks her phone what aggrieved means and then adjudication. Vicky then summarizes these definitions in preteen talk to her friend Susie, who flashes a double thumbs up to indicate her understanding. Jordan continues, These nice people on the town council don't get paid to meet each month and do nothing. Their meetings are streamed live on the internet, so they've got to be seen doing something. They've probably seen in the national media how cops everywhere have been shutting down little girls' lemonade stands, and they figured they'd better get with the program. Passing new town ordinances makes these people look strong and socially responsible. Plus, they badly need the revenue from licensing fees. Besides, one can't have young ladies like yourselves selling lemonade without a license. If this kind of criminal practice were allowed to continue, pretty soon anybody could be selling anything to anybody else, and God knows where we'd all be then. So here's what you need to understand. Regulations against selling food to the public apply only when you're selling food to whom? Susie brightens and says, the public. Correctamundo, Susie, the public. So if you want to sell lemonade to people who walk past your lemonade stand, these people can't be the public, right? Susie looks confused, even as a glimmer of recognition and a sly smile cross Vicky's face as she senses that knowing her dad, this is about to get fun. Jordan continues, Regulations are put in place to protect the public, but regulations have no effect over private membership organizations. For example, I know you ladies like to go bowling. Imagine that you form a bowling club. All of the bowling clubs in New England meet for an outdoor festival where dozens of tables are set up to sell lemonade, cookies, t-shirts, and other items to bowling club members. Would the police bother to try and stop these sales activities from occurring? No, because the bowling club is a private club. You can't even get into the festival without being a member. At this point, Vicky can scarcely contain herself. Susie doesn't quite get it yet, so Vicky turns to her friend and exclaims, Susie, all we have to do is form a lemonade club. If people join our club, then we can sell them lemonade all day long, and we don't need a license. Light dawns on Susie, who now clasps her hands with glee. The girls decide to call their subversive operation the Lemonade Society and declare themselves to be charter members. They make all new signage, a fresh batch of lemonade, and they head back outdoors to resume operations. Officer Bryce, who has been dutifully circling the neighborhood in his taxpayer-funded crime cruiser looking for further signs of suspicious activity, spots the lemonade stand, hits the switch to activate the flashing blue lights, and quickly pulls over. As he approaches the girls, he can be seen speaking into the microphone attached to the shoulder strap on his uniform. This appears to be a high-level communication since he's whispering into the mic. Okay, that's it. I'm going to have to write you up. I'm sorry. What does that mean, officer? Says Vicky. It means you're going to get a ticket for selling lemonade without a license. But officer, we don't sell lemonade to the public. You're still selling lemonade, that's all I know, and I gave you fair warning that if you didn't get a license, I would have to fine you. But officer, now we only sell lemonade to members of the Lemonade Society. Officer Bryce, once again sensing that he may be out of his league entirely, spots the sign which now reads in large letters, Lemonade Society, one dollar per cup to members only. Officer Bryce mutters, so where are your members? Vicky, well right now, officer, there are just the two of us, but would you like to join too? And how would I become a member? You just pay the membership fee. What does it cost to join? It's just a dollar to become a member. And why would I want to be a member? Vicky smiles and setting this up like Minnesota Slim preparing to clear the entire pool table with a single cue ball says, 
because each new member gets a free glass of lemonade. Officer Bryce, to his everlasting credit, experiences an epiphany, doubles over, and bursts out laughing. The girls start laughing too. Jordan steps up and joins in the fun. Officer Bryce, did you put them up to this? Jordan, officer, I merely explained to the girls the difference between the inalienable right of contract within a private organization, beyond all claims of state regulation of protecting the public, and the taking of a license which grants a privilege and as such can be regulated and taxed. Now, Officer Bryce didn't quite get all of that, but he chuckles and says, hey, I wasn't here and I didn't see this. You folks have a nice day and while I'm at it, may I join? I could use a nice glass of cold lemonade. Officer Bryce hands Susie a $1 bill. Vicky declares him a member and hands him his free glass of lemonade. By the end of the afternoon, the girls have 20 Federal Reserve notes and 20 new members. As they're packing up with Jordan's help, he explains, Vicky, remember when we read Sun Tzu's Art of War? He who enters the battlefield first loses. If the town tries to shut you ladies down, we'll just write them a letter explaining the law, as well as the liability that they would incur for violating your constitutional right of private contract. We'll throw in several Supreme Court decisions that the town lawyer will have to read and respond to at his usual rate of $300 an hour that the town will have to pay for. Now, if the town council is dumb enough to proceed, and that is entirely possible, we'll file Bivens suits against each council member in their individual capacity outside of their roles as town council members. Council members will now have to pay their own lawyers $300 an hour out of their own pockets to answer these motions, at which point I would imagine that their lemonade crime problem would probably come to a grinding halt. So don't worry, girls. This probably isn't going anywhere. Now, the next thing for you girls to do if you really want to rake in some dough and promote freedom across the land is to form the American Constitutional Peace, Love, and Lemonade Society and charter local clubs all across the nation. Start a YouTube channel, let Lemonade Freedom go viral, and pretty soon you'll be a guest on Oprah. Or maybe that can wait until you're a little older. And thus did freedom prevail in a small New England town. It wasn't the Bridget Concord or Bunker Hill, but a small shot glass of lemonade went around the world as the meme caught on. Pretty soon, unlicensed street vendors could be seen everywhere across the land, selling to their new members in wild abandon. Everyone felt so free you'd think you were in Mexico. As the concept expanded, chiropractors, homeopaths, herbalists, and other alternative health and wellness practitioners could be seen creating private health freedom memberships, holding regional meetings, engaging in other activities of legitimate private organizations, and offering in-office health and wellness services for members only. The only recourse for governing bodies to thwart this dangerous rising tide of freedom would be to rewrite the federal and state constitutions. And believe me, they're working on it.